Thank you, Ben, Daphne, Rooney, and all the team for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here today talking about one of not only my uh, research main interests, but also one of my passions. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about breastfeeding in the NICU. And since, since this conference is called Delphi, which I don't know if all of you know, it's a temple in Greece where people went to seek for knowledge. I don't know if you know that. So first of all, I just want to ask you guys to make an experience with me before I tell you this story. So if you can, and if you would, please stand up. Trust me, it's not dangerous. It's okay. Just please stand up normally with her, relax your arms, okay? Now close your eyes and just pay attention to what your body feels like. What do you need to do to just stand up and be in your balance, okay? Okay, you can open your eyes now. Now what I'm gonna ask you to do is to put one feet in front of the other, I don't care which feet, but make sure that your thumb touches your heel, okay? Now close your eyes. <laughs> okay, you can open. I said it's not danger, dangerous. I said it was not dangerous, but I didn't say it was easy. So what I didn't tell you before, you can sit down, thank you very much. <laughs> what I didn't tell you before is that I'm also a yogi student. So I've been practicing for many, many years. And uh, one of the things that yoga taught me was to carry on all the teachings that the positions I make can apply to my life. And this little experience that you did this, you did here with me today, uh, it kind of makes me think about that mother that's entering the NICU. Her gestation was finished before time. She didn't know that was going to happen. She's scared and she comes to the NICU. So when, before all that happened, she was standing with her feet wide open, with her base, and she had her, by, her balance, right? When somebody tells her, it's gonna, we can't take on your gestation, your baby's gonna born, return, is she, we close her eyes. But then she's used to that position, she has her base, and she can keep her balance because she can pull some inner, inner forces to maintain her balance. But when, we take her to the NICU and she doesn't know what's gonna happen and she see her tiny baby, that very vulnerable baby, and she sees all those beeps and the ventilator and the incubator and all the tubes. And we, as a team, we are all around the baby. Sometimes we can't even see the baby because there are so many people around the baby. This is like when we put the feet in front of the other, she loses her balance, and then we close her eyes. We, we don't explain what's going to happen. And on top of all that, we tell her that it is important for her to take her milk for the baby. So how do we approach that? How do we make her feel when she enters the NICU? She sees her baby and she has, we give her, we give her that task. To, to provide breast milk for her baby. So that makes me think, now comes the, the, Greek, the, Greece, the, yeah, the Greek myth. That makes me think about Procrustes. Procrustes was this guy, he had a household in the sacred way to Athens, where were the temples where people were going to seek for knowledge. And he would go by the road and invite the passersby to come to his house and to take a nap in his bed. And what people didn't know when they got to the house, the bed was never right for them. They would never fit the bed. If they were too big for the bed, Procrucis would stretch them so they would fit perfectly in the bed. If they were too big for the bed, Procrucis would cut off their legs so they would fit in the bed. So there's a word that says Procrustean. The Procrustean word is used to describe situations where an arbitrary standard is used to measure success, while completely disregarding obvious harm that results from the effort. So that makes me think, is this how we are approaching breastfeeding in the NICU? Are we telling our mothers 
that they have to achieve unachievable standards and how can we change that? So first of all, we have to think, is your NICU breastfeeding friendly? Do you know who the mothers are? Do you know if they live close to the hospital, if they have access, if they can go to the hospital, if they can stay with the baby, if they have other kids at home, if they had people to help her take care of those other kids. Otherwise, if you tell her that she has to come to the to hospital, to the NICU, and express like eight times a day, or that she has to start that expression very early on, or she won't have enough milk for the baby, it's just an unattainable goal. So how are we, where are we putting parents in the care of their babies when we are talking about breastfeeding? What is the place we have for them in our NICU? Now, let me talk a little bit about innovation. And I swear to God, I looked at chat GPT, GPT before Ben's talk, okay? So, <laughs> I swear, it was. When we think about innovation, all of us, what we think is about robots and IA and flying cars and, right? Most of us and chat GPT. So I asked chat GPT what, what the definition of innovation. And the answer I got was innovation refers to the process of creating something new or improving upon an existing product, process, or idea. It involves generating and implementing new and creative ideas that add value to individuals, businesses, and society as a whole. Innovation can take many forms, including techno technological advancements, process improvements, new businesses models, and creative solutions to complex problems. Successful innovation often requires a combination of creativity, research, development, and effective implementation strategies. And I thought it was perfect, like all the answers. So innovation is much more about adaptation. It's, a, in, it's about changing our habits, our loss, and our process, or combining them in a different way so we can achieve success. All, all those who work in the NICU know the, about the importance of the mother's own milk for their babies. And yesterday during the talks, we were, we were I don't remember who said it, we don't have a medication that would, uh, that would redefine neonatology and save babies after surfactant. We didn't have something that was very important. And I disagree. I think that mother's own milk is that. It's not a medication. It's not for free, it comes at a cost for the mother. But we all know the literature is there for you to see that it improves neurodevelopment, it improves BPD, it improves ROP. And why? why aren't we investing in that? Why aren't we changing our habits, our loss, our processes to offer it to the most of our preterm infants who are the most vulnerable babies we care for? And what much of us sometimes we don't realize is that breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding at the first six months and then complemented at two years of age at least, can have a positive impact on children's and women's health. And this is a long-term impact. It has been proven that mother's own milk exclusively offered to the babies during the first six months of life is able to, is, is, can provide higher IQs for the, for the children. If they have a better intelligence development, they can achieve, they go bad, best in school, they go better in school. If they go better in school, they have better jobs. If they have better jobs, they get better paid. And that is a way we can improve in our society to reduction of poverty, especially in countries like mine in Brazil. So, we, we have to think about investing in breastfeeding for these babies as a way to bring opportunities to improve our economy and our society. So how do we do that? How can we do that to our babies? 
So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my experience. So we can use those three pillars of innovation that I showed you in the beginning of the presentation. And we can start by changing our habits. I'm a professor and I work with undergrads. My students, uh, they go through pediatrics at the fourth year of medical school. We don't have colleges, six years of medical school. So I began to take them to the milk bank. So they go to the milk bank and they know all the work that is done there and they are amazed by it. So we teach them about the importance of that so they can replicate that to their families, to the other women they are going to uh, attend during their lives. And we make this experience, we have this, um, we have those breasts that we can put in, the, your, in your neck and we have a male student to do that. So he can understand how the mother, the mother can position the baby so she can breastfeed better in a comfort way. So it is important to introduce breastfeeding medicine as soon as we can in the med school. We can do it by changing laws. So I have the incredible luck of working with Denise. You met her yesterday during her talk. So I can, whenever I can, whenever she needs me, I collaborate with her organization. And one of these collaborations is about going to our city council to explain to the politics the importance of breastfeeding and why we should be doing laws to improve, to support breastfeeding in our NICUs and why this is so important to our babies. And the benefits of it, they take from it from a long time in their lives. We are raising healthier citizens. They're gonna need less and less from our health systems. So we have to show them that this is beneficial. We know it, it is. But we have to show the politicians, we have to speak their language, so we have to translate our, our researches so they can understand the importance of it. And a way we can do that is advocating together with organizations, together with families. The other way we can do is changing processes. So, as I told you yesterday, we have adopted the prolonged oropharyngeal colostrum administration. So we start as soon as we can, as soon as the mother can provide colostrum, and we keep it together with the enteral feedings through the tube until the baby can transition to the oral, to the oral diet. I, I don't know if that, I hope, yeah. So this is a baby, her name is Marina. She was born at 22 weeks. She had a twin sister who sadly was deceased during the first three days of life. And here she is, eight days old, receiving her mother's own colostrum. So we have implemented that in our unit. It is included in our prescription and everybody does it for all the babies who are, we know are not going to receive oral feedings very soon. And doing this simple procedure, we have included the family, we have brought the family, we have opened our circle, that circle that comes around the incubator of the baby that much times doesn't have space for the family, for the mother, like yesterday in the talk that um, Elizabeth said, the mother, she said she felt useless. So we changed that because that's it. When we tell them they have to provide only 2.5 ml of milk and we can offer colostrum during the whole day, their, their faces light up. That is something they, they feel like they can do and that changes the game. The other thing we, that came from changing this, this simple habit was uh, fathers began to ask if they could do it too. And here's a picture of a father who is offering colostrum to her baby, to his baby, and he said, I can breastfeed too. So this is another game changer for them. This is a picture of another baby born at 22 weeks. This was on World Prematurity Day. It was her first kangaroo care. And here is all the team that was necessary to do, like in the other talk we saw today, to take the baby from the incubator and put it in her mother's chest 
and if I, so I have here the physical therapist, I have two nurses, I have the nutritionist, I have the psychologist and myself. All those people stopped all they were doing to take this tiny baby from the incubator and put her in her mother's chest because they understand the importance of it and because they know that this action is gonna offer the mother the opportunity of produce even more milk. And this is the last picture. These are the families. This is what's before the pandemics. They felt so connected to our team, so connected to the care of their, their, their children. They're all parents of preterm infants below 30, 30 weeks gestational age. And they came by the end of the year and they gave us this beautiful Christmas tree as a thank you gift, as a recognition of how they felt connected to the NICU, how we, they really made us, they gave us the privilege of being part of their families. So, I was talking about what is the place we give parents in our NICU when we're talking about breastfeeding. And now I am going again to the Greek because they have three words which I think could describe very much which kind of NICU do we want to, thinking about placing the parents. Do we want a NICU that they feel like they are living in an atopy, a place where they have no place? They feel like they don't belong. Many parents, many families tell us, I, I don't wanna get near the baby, I don't wanna come to the NICU, I feel like I'm getting in the way. So they feel like they have no place. Do we want a NICU where the parents feel like they are in an atopy? We can have a NICU where the par parents feel like they are in a dystopia. A dystopia is a place that feels like a nightmare. Nothing is like it should be. They feel like they are not heard. They feel like they are not seen if seen at all. They feel like in those nightmares where you try to run but you can't get away. We can make them feel like that. Is that the place we want for the families in our NICUs? Or we can transform our NICUs in a place where they feel like they are in a utopia. An utopia is a place that supposedly everything is supposed to be perfect, everything is supposed to work, and everything goes exactly how it's supposed to be. And I know what you're thinking, that's impossible, right? But then the best definition of utopia, the one that I really like that talks to me, was given by Eduardo Galeano, which was, is my favorite Uruguayan writer. Galeano was giving the speech to his students and they were talking, it was Galeano and uh, an Argentinian movie director. And one of, the, uh, one of the students asked what was utopia for them. And Galeano said, utopia is just over the horizon. I approach two steps, it moves two steps away. I walk 10 steps and the horizon runs 10 steps. No matter how far I walk, I will never reach it. What is utopia good for? It is good to prevent you to stop walking. So do you remember the video I showed you of Marina at eight days of age? Here she is. She is now three years. She came back to visit us last month at the NICU. And she is this patient that was, she changed the game for me because she validated the place where we work and she showed us that it pays to keep walking. So please, keep all walking. Thank you very much. <laughs>